my high school, when I was in high school, my church, we had a high school basketball team, and I played for them. And we had the same colors in my high school, um, yellow and blue. I know it sounds odd for me to be saying that, but those were our colors. And uh, so we, we, we played high school basketball from, like, December to March. And um, back when I was in high school, you committed a foul, you had to do what? Not only did you have to raise your hand, you also had to say, okay, my number is here. Not that I ever committed a foul, right? I'm not sure if that happens today. Sometimes people go, I see players go like this. Ah, nonsense, all right? But we had to admit that we, were, we, were, we fouled. Um, so he was a superstar for the Detroit Lions, Barry Sanders, you know what I'm referring to, like all world. And Barry Sanders, of course, he made a lot of money. He's driving a sports car in the Detroit area, and he got pulled over for speeding. And um, the officer came up, tapped on his window, and said, um, you know how it goes. Well, maybe you don't. I shouldn't say I know how it goes either. License, registration, form, and proof of insurance. Not that I know how that goes, okay? I saw it on TV. All right. You don't believe me, do you? It's all right, okay. License, registration, form, and proof of insurance. And he looked at the license. You Barry Sanders? Because I'll tell you what, if you sign a couple things, I can get you off. And Barry Sanders says, no, that's a different Barry Sanders. See, Barry Sanders is a Christian man and realized he was what? Speeding and deserved a ticket. Uh, a humble person. I think you heard that in the readings today. So I want to ask you all, do you agree that the hardest thing to do is admit that you're wrong? What do you think? Is it the hardest thing to admit that you're wrong? And, and maybe I don't want to admit I'm wrong because I'm going to get punished or I have to feel the shame of guilt. It's the hardest thing to admit that you're wrong. What do you think? Sometimes difficult. When I was a young boy, I didn't like to admit I was wrong, but it was coming. And so Adam and Eve are hiding in the garden. And by the way, can anyone hide from God? No, and they sinned. They sinned by eating the what? The fruit, the apple, whatever it was. And uh, they knew they sinned, and so they knew they were naked, and they clothed themselves. And so God said, Adam, where are you? Now, that, now of course, God knows geographically where Adam is. God knows all things. Also, it's rather dumb to think you can hide from God. But maybe God's saying, Adam, where are you spiritually with me? Where are you in my, your relationship with me? Because right now you're hiding from me. That's not good. Now, now we've got to love the response. And by the way, gentlemen, I, I recommend that you don't use this response. So God told Adam, you know, what is this you have done? And here's Adam's response. Can you all read it? The man said what? <laughs> it's a woman you, gave, woman you gave me. So, gentlemen, you're married. Okay, all right, you get the picture. And then God looked at Eve and said, Eve, what have you done? And what did Eve say? The serpent. And so, Adam and Eve, how do we know about sin? Because they did what? The woman you gave me, the serpent you gave me. So, I want to ask you this question. Do you agree or disagree? To err is human. To blame someone else when we err is what? What do you think? Is there some wisdom there? Blame somebody else? Well, isn't that what Adam did? <laughs> the woman you gave me? Isn't that what Eve did? Well, the serpent? Anybody but who? Moi. In the French. Michael Fay. I'm not sure you ever heard of Michael Fay. I'm going to tell you the Michael Fay story. Michael Fay, there's three pictures there. The one on the left is Singapore. The one in the uh, middle is Michael Fay being arrested. And the last one's a king. It's a cane pole. I'm going to explain them all to you in a bit, okay? So let me tell you the Michael Fay story. I'm not sure if any of you remember, okay? Michael Fay was an international student in Singapore in 1993, typical American teenager, okay? I'm not here to bash American teenagers. Sure, nice guy. He wanted to have fun. Michael Fay, with his other high school boys, got bored, and so he got busted. He's charged with 67 acts of vandalism. So what Michael Fay did at night is he... Do you guys remember you used to have antennas in your car? Remember that? Maybe some of you still do. And he snapped off the antennas, and he, he, he spray-painted cars and spray-painted the walls and, and garages, and he maybe made a couple flat tires. That's what he did when he got bored in Singapore. So he's charged with 67 acts of vandalism, two acts of mischief, and, and they raided his apartment where he lived with other uh, high school or college students, and he got busted with possession of 16 stolen items. Okay, well, all right, well, what's, what's the big deal? Well... The big deal is that in 1966, the Vandalism Act of Singapore sentenced him to four months in jail and 12 cane what? Now, this isn't like getting hit uh, with the switch off the tree. I'm not sure if there's any of you have memories of that or dad's belt. Don't have to tell me any of your memories of that. This is like grandma's pillow. You know what grandma's pillow is? A little pillow at the end of it. Uh, this is with, by a professional martial artist, and welts will remain for months. 
This is what the Singapore government was going to do to them. This is what they do. Now in America, and I'm being somewhat facetious here, in America you do that, uh, you, you share about your childhood memories, maybe you're picked on, uh, you go to a counselor and you go to a talk show. In Singapore, you get caned, okay? And so th this wasn't a dead issue. President Carter and congressmen and senators got involved and, and they asked, uh, hey, you know, we don't do that. And Singapore says, well, we're not like the West. We don't coddle people. Um, you do the crime, you pay the what? The time. And so, um, now Americans were split over this, 50-50. 50% Americans said, listen, don't be so harsh on Michael. 50% Americans said what? Let him have it. Give it to him, okay? And so, uh, his sentence was reduced to less than time in prison, but he still had to get caned four times, four strokes, and it was very painful. And so that was administered, carried on May 5th, 1994. Now, I'm not sure where you stand, if she'd been, he, she'd been caned or not by a professional martial artist, but it got carried through. And uh, the Singapore government basically told President Carter and American congressmen and said, and senators, this is how we deal with things here. Well, well you know how it goes, okay? There's a cane pole, and I have a picture of Jesus, there's no grace for him. There's no grace for him. Well, we heard these sayings before, don't do the crime if you can't what? You mess with a bull, you get the what? Make the bed, you what? You made the bed, now lie in it. And so Michael Fay was punished. I'm not sure I feel about it. But here's the interesting thing. They asked Michael Fay like six months later if he's done any more vandalism, snapped off antennas and spray paint, and guess what Michael Fay said? No. Asked him if it crossed his mind, guess, guess what he said? No, why? <laughs> Never mind, okay? All right. Um, I'm going to go back 700 years before the birth of Christ to Israel, and uh, let, let's, let's hear about what they did. And so the, the story of Israel is one of guilty idolatry and rebellion. Uh, they decided to worship other gods. They brought pagan stuff into their temples, and they, they blamed each other. So God calls them out. I'm going to read this to you. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. What that proverb was about is that the Israelites used to, used to like to blame other people. So if I, I'm, a, I'm a young person in Israel, I could blame the sins on my dad. Well, but that, that just wasn't a good guy. You see, I learned that from my dad. And, and God said, no longer am I going to accept the blame game. Um, you do the crime, you pay the time. Read this with me. That's sort of like God's act. That's sort of like God's act. You sin, you're going to get busted, you're guilty, you're going to get punished. Okay? Now let's go to our story in 2023. I'll read it. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. All have turned away and have become worthless. There is no one who does good now, and now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those that the whole world will be held accountable to God. Everyone will be held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in the sight of God by observing the law. And so, just like God called out Israel, God's calling who out, who out, us out. He says all of us are sinned. All of us have fallen short. None of us is righteous. So who's a sinner? You and who? Me. And we're guilty. We're all sinners. I, I, think, the, I think the confirmands and the child who came up, we're all sinners, okay? So, so I'm going to talk about sin a little bit. What's sin? Well, sin is missing the mark of God's holiness. Uh, the arrow of my behavior misses the mark. What's sin? Sin is trespassing where I'm not supposed to trespass. That's sinning. Uh, a sinning is going outside the boundaries of, of where God has put me. A sin is crossing the line. Uh, if you were in the summer Bible class this summer by Reverend Keller, I look at what Reverend Keller said about sin. Sin is misplaced love. So things I ought not love, I place on top, and things I ought to love, I place on the bottom. Sin is misplaced love. And to that, God calls us out. Just like the Israelites, and just like Michael Fay got called out. Sin. Okay? Um, I'm not sure if you've seen this movie. While Michael Fay was in court, uh, this is a good movie to see. I mean, there's some foul language, but there's really a, a good theme. In this movie, there is uh, Billy O'Connell, and he's, he goes to his private gentlemen's school, this private young boys school. 
where they raise senators and congressmen and lawyers and presidents. And he sees a crime. He see, sees vandalism, but he's going to report it because he doesn't want to be a snitch. And there's Al Pacino, and he's a retired colonel. And uh, he admires Billy uh, for not snitching and for, for not snitching and accepting responsibility for anything he's called for. And in the movie, Al Pacino calls himself a loco parentis. Now, what's loco parentis? It's Latin for a temporary parent. I'm standing in the place as parent. In other words, Al Pacino is going to be an advocate. He's going to stand in the breach. And that leads us, I'm going to summarize this. What's similar between Michael Fay and Israel and us? They all had advocates. Now, now Michael Fay had the American government as an advocate. Israel has Jesus Christ, grace and advocate. You and I have an advocate for Jesus Christ, okay? And the advocate is someone who stands in the breach. I love that picture. You see the bridge between the two, two hills. An advocate is someone who stands in the breach when we're in the valley. Now, what's different between Michael Fay, Israel, and us? Michael Fay received no grace or mercy. He got what? Punished. For you and I, we have the opportunity for what? Mercy and grace. We have the opportunity to be forgiven. We have the opportunity not to be caned. All right? Israel and us are afforded grace and mercy. Can you read that with me, please? I will judge each one according to your ways. Repent, turn away from your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. You see, God told Israel, you don't want to be punished? Confess your sin to me that you might be redeemed. And I love what the one, what one, one of the said. Confessing, repenting, and Savior, basically all the same thing. This is what God says to us. Can you read it? This is now to us. Go ahead and read it, please. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. You see, we have an opportunity for mercy and grace. Uh, Jesus stands for us in the breach. Read this. Yeah. See, the reality is you and I are all sinners. I think, I think we know that. I, I don't have to explain that to you. Whether it's lust, greed, laziness, idolatry, blame game, blaspheme, foul mouth, whatever. I think we all know we're sinners. And we all know we've heard it so many times that Jesus forgives us. But here, what God's saying to us is, you need to, we need to repent. We need to confess to God. We need to come clean and say, God, I'm the one who, who sinned against you. Just like God told Israel, just like God's telling us to repent. About six, seven weeks ago, um, my younger brother calls me every Monday to share with me how my dad's doing. I think I'm going to go in uh, next Thursday, Friday to go see my dad. And uh, one of my siblings then, every Monday my brother calls, says this is how dad's doing. Well, later in the week someone says dad's not doing well. I said, that's not good. So I, so I packed my bags. If you don't know, my dad's 88. He has stage 3B uh, colon cancer. And so he, he, he's been doing fine, but they said he's not doing well. And then, and then two days later, a, a sibling said, we took Dad to the hospital. I said, what's going on? Dad was dehydrated. What happened is in the middle of August, he, re, he refused to turn on the air, and he sat in an 85-degree heat with humidity over weeks, and it just evaporated, and he got dehydrated. He said his muscles were cramping. And the doctor said some of your organs aren't working, so they immediately gave an IV to him and started pumping him full of liquids, and thank God he recovered. But here's a point I'm getting to. It was my sibling who came in and had to talk my dad. We love you, Dad. You're cramping. You can't walk. This is something serious. You need to go where? Hospital. You know you're sick. We know you're sick. The doctors and hospitals can help you. You need to decide if you want to what? Go and let us help you. It was my sibling that was able to talk to my dad lovingly and say, you're sick, the doctors and hospitals can help, but you got to what? Admit it and go get help. Repentance, I, I, I love this saying. Jesus is the agent of repentance who moves us from sin to salvation. Because Jesus says, not only do I love you, confess your sin, repent, give it up. And when we repent of sins... 
our heart changes. Lord, I don't want to swear anymore. Lord, I don't want to lust anymore. Lord, I don't want to be selfish anymore. Lord, I don't want to, I don't want to be mean anymore. Lord, Lord, I don't want to blow you off anymore. Lord, I know I need to be closer to you. Lord, I need to, know, I know I need to read your word more. Lord, I need to be more respectful. Lord, I need to be kinder to that kid in class who acts like a fool. When we confess those sins, God begins to clean it up and our lives begin to change. Jesus is the agent who moves us from sin to salvation. He wipes away all of our sins. Can you read the saying from Martin Luther? Go ahead. It deals with repentance. Once again, I'm a sinner. I despair that God, please forgive me. I don't want to do it anymore. That's repentance. That's a blessing. So I'm going to ask you, because I asked the children this, who has a problem? Say it. I do. Who has a cure? Where? In our baptism font, in the Lord's Supper, in the spoken word, we are all forgiven. I, I, I love this. I love this hymn. Chief of sinners, though I be Jesus Christ, what? Died for me. One of my confirmands a number of years ago said, Pastor, I got it. Chief of sinners, though I be, Pastor Muse is worse than me. Okay, that's what he said. So, so I locked him in the closet. No, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> But chief of sinners, though I be what? Jesus died for me. Repent and live. We have a problem. Jesus has a cure. In our font here, community, they all end the cross. So, how about this for a closing thought? Let's read it right. Chief of sinners, though I be, Jesus shed his blood for me. Died that I might live on high. Lives that I might never die. As the branches to the vine, I am his and he is mine. And, say it, all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Right.